Well, Gary, uh, Ivo, Gary particularly, have been stressing this point. A, a problem is an opportunity. A crisis creates a solution. Well, it's so, so true. We have just, we as the organizers of this uh, uh, conference today, just got at 12 o'clock yesterday, the notice from the Secretary General of the Club of Rome. He was in China, came back to Switzerland, and got terribly sick. He suffered all night, and in the morning, he had to run to the doctor, that was yesterday, and at 12 o'clock, I got the notice that he's not coming for this conference today. Well, it's a problem, but it's an opportunity, because actually, it allowed me to be a speaker, which was not planned in the conference. And I did want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> and since I happened to be a member of that Club of Rome, since I was on the executive committee of it, so I know it fairly well. So if there are any issues or questions regarding the Club of Rome, I think I would be able to answer them too. But actually, I'll act here in the role of sort of a link between the, the academy and the outside world and Ukraine, because it is in this afternoon that it will be Ukrainians talking about uh, Ukraine, but talking more about precisely how come that a new paradigm has been demonstrated here, perhaps not born here, but certainly demonstrated here, that is really when on Maidan, when they st uh, were started being attacked, some services appeared. All of us Ukrainians know that very well. The medical service, religious service, psychiatric service, educational service. Now, why did people launch these services? I can start with one, Olya Bumovic. Everybody knows her, a medical service. She didn't get any order from anybody. There was no help from, any, uh, from the government, at least. It is just, she said, I'm doing it. And a number of people that knew something about medicine joined her of different ages, but with uh, some kind of skill in the field. Why did she do it? Why did she do it? She do it out of the sense of obligation to her fellow countrymen. Just as do people who actually go east on the front, risking their health, certainly risking their lives. Why do they do it? They don't get paid for that, out of the sense of obligation to their country. So while, uh, thanks to the academy, with which I discussed that a year and a half ago, that we need a new paradigm for the world, and that meant two elements in it, that we needed a universal declaration of the sense of obligation. And also, we should be shifting to more cooperative mode of relationships between individuals, groups, countries, etc. Shift away from just clamoring for human rights, according to that declaration in 1948, a wonderful declaration but caused actually a lot of difficulties because people were harshly competing for about everything, people, groups, countries, including you know, how to ascertain their rights, how to make use of their rights, how to make them real. And not everybody could, precisely because of this competitive mode in even some very wealthy countries. It is only the wealthy ones that could have all the rights, like the rights to have and the possibility to send their children for quality education, the right of health care, access to the best health care. But a lot of the people in those very wealthy countries had no access to the health care and no possibility for their children to actually get to any kind of quality education. So uh, this is when I say that I'm acting as a link. Now, yes, our colleagues, friends, my friends, from the World Academy for Art and Science, I think made it 
in, in a wonderful way, very clear, that the world needs some changes. And it is changes along all the vectors. But maybe one of the most fundamental changes that are needed is just that, that people will start acting more out of the sense of obligation. And it is obligation to self, obligation to family, etc. I guess a lot of you have probably already read that list that we have proposed for them. Now, so really, uh, this afternoon, we'll have a number of people that were on Maidan. Surprisingly, some of these people actually are not just these younger people with whom it started. Why they started, you know that. They started in protest to the fact that Yanukovych, the, the previous president of Ukraine, who was a gangster rather than a president, who wanted absolute power and absolute wealth, and he did not want to sign this association agreement with the European Union. So there was an immediate protest by the young. It started in Lviv, in the western city in Ukraine, and quickly shifted to the center of Ukraine, to, to, to Kyiv. And then these other events happened. We'll hear about it this afternoon, but I just wanted to produce a little bit of an introduction to that. But certainly, uh, our colleagues and Alberto, that is the three, you know, in these couple of days, they got to know our country, but particularly they got to know our young people. They got to know this program, Young Generation Will Change Ukraine. And it is really wonderful that actually they saw, well, this is a reality. And even maybe there are some ways in which teach, really people can learn, like our young people are learning, that should be the model even for this world university if we are planning, rather than just having, say, the best professors giving the best lectures, and everybody anywhere in the world could be listening to them, you know, in their own language, etc. I think it's a wonderful idea, but it is not quite the idea that you actually were hinting at that should be. And some universities actually are practicing more or less already, like Oxford, for example, the, with this tutorial system, I think it is an example that education can be in that form, and it is a better form of education, because it is not, knowledge is not dumped on them, is not forced on them. Yes, they do have to read a lot of books, they're discussing, debating, and selecting from it what they feel is good, relevant, and connecting things. So, uh, I'll therefore surprise you, and rather than talking for half an hour, I would stop now, so we would have it some time, yeah, we have 20 minutes for some answers. They don't have to be answers, they can also be the suggestions, and Gary and Eva are still here, I hope, and, and Alberto is here, so the, answer, the, question, the, the questions can be directed to anybody, and if they don't answer them, I will. So, uh, Gary and Evo yeah, they in. could, please do. So, uh, my lecture is finished. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not a lecture, and now we have the time to debate. I wish it would be great if that light <laughs> beaming and blinding us would disappear, because for me, it's extremely difficult to talk to you if I don't see you. I like to see the eyes. I like to see, I like to get that quiet resonance that comes through the eyes. And otherwise, you know, kind of I'm, I'm, I'm talking as if I was blindfolded. Is it possible, Olena, or if you have some... But Mitrosu, you need to say it in Ukrainian so that people will understand you. Technician обслуга, якщо б ви могли якось ці світла, що жахливо нас засліплюють тут на сцені, якось їх закрити, щоб ми бачили тих людей, які хочуть нас слухати. А ми хочемо їх бачити очі, ми хочемо бачити реакції. І ми хочемо їх слухати, але слухати і бачити їх. Можливо чи неможливо? Я дуже прошу. 
I fully agree with you. You? <laughs> well, for once you do, eh? <laughs> well, it is not young people and not from the program Young Generation Will Change Ukraine that seem to be in charge of this electricity. So <laughs> Bogdan Mudrich, may I start then? Huh? Um, may I start first question? Do. Good morning, first of all, to all of the speakers, and thank you very much for all of uh, your comments. I'm Victoria Vdovichenko, one of the alumni now of Bogdan Revolution Association for the Young Generation Will Change Ukraine. And I would like to thank you also for the remarks, uh, especially to, Prof uh, to Dr. Zuconi, who was making um, that too many teachers we have, but there are so few facilitators. And I think it's something that uh, reminds us to the current contemporary situation and how uh, Professor Havrelishan said to us that um, basically a problem is an opportunity but the crisis also can give us the solution is uh, also for the long-term perspective. So my question whether will be how to transform this shift of the teachers into the facilitators. A short remark, I'm a teacher as well. So. Very interesting to know. Thank you. Uh, well, actually, there are several programs, uh, and the research uh, show that uh, they are effective. Uh, one uh, that I know very well and uh, that uh, we uh, use in Italy is uh, teacher effectiveness training. Uh, and uh, uh, is uh, the research show that if the teacher, you know, the research is uh, done uh, by having a, a month uh, a tape recorder in the classroom uh, that records uh, every moment uh, what is going on uh, interaction. For example, it's shown uh, that uh, if uh, the teacher uh, is uh, uh, speaking less uh, than the student, if he's uh, uh, student-centered, uh, if he's uh, passionate uh, about uh, what uh, is the subject matter, and if he shows uh, empathy, trust uh, in the process, uh, and is willing uh, to give uh, empowerment and so experiment, uh, the results uh, on the subject matter, people learn more, they have less absence, uh, and they do have uh, much less uh, disruptive behavior in the school. This is done uh, the research from classroom uh, of uh, elementary, kindergarten, elementary school, uh, up to uh, undergraduate. There are, and this research is about done in Germany, United States, in Canada, and other country. Uh, a total of 250,000 students have been. So there is a, a lot of already uh, going on, but uh, to do this, uh, we cannot say, like uh, Gary pointed out, this is education, this is the economy. Because uh, behind this, in my opinion, there is a power, you know, the issue of power. To be student-centered, uh, you have to relinquish uh, the exclusive power of the professor-centered mode. So the promotion of change in this regard has to be more democratic. But the subject matter should be not mechanicistic or reductionistic, but also, as Gary was saying, to be interdisciplinary and intersectorial. But we don't have the final solution. So I think we have to really learn uh, along uh, and experiment. Can I just add to that quickly? You answer. Now, I wanted to answer that question simply so you could move to other questions. Let me suggest this, that's from personal experience, that professors should be teaching subjects that they have not studied. I had an education in engineering. It was very good education, I must say. And then I was asked to be a professor in a management school that was in Canada, and I was asked to be a professor of management school in Geneva. And on the plane, I decided that I would teach sociology of economic development. I had not studied sociology nor economic development. But that was wonderful, because in the class, you know, there are a number of people, among the participants, let's say on the MBA program, post-experience, let's say 33 years of age on the average, 
there are several people that knew a lot, even, uh, uh, even had doctorate in sociology economics. So I could not just dump my wonderful knowledge on them. I had to ask some questions, you see. Uh, so it immediately became, if you like, they were actually contributing to it. So it was immediately, so I think that really the trick for the facilitator is really to help with the questions or raising some questions rather than immediately giving the answer. I think it's a little bit dramatic of a suggestion, but it did work. It really worked. You know, because the students have liked it very much. So maybe we can go to other questions, and my colleagues, I'm sure, you know, maybe you'll interact, you know, on the corridor or whatever. Another question there? Good, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to address to Professor Tukoni. I completely agree with uh, the ideas of a student-centered education, and I would like to ask um, which ways uh, should Ukraine uh, find in solving the problem of uh, uh, our education. We have, as all of us know, that post-Soviet uh, system of education. How can we change it to the European one, to that another standards of education like uh, people-centered centered and student-centered and um, not memorizing but critical thinking Okay. How can we change the it? question? And so, thank you very much. Uh, just came back to me because Gary mentioned earlier that we need one university created every day. We happen to have 800 universities in Ukraine, and I think we could do very well with 80, and maybe the rest we could export. But in the export, they would have to be actually transform themselves to be student centered. Well, anyway, this is a not, not just a, a joke, actually, I'm suggesting a bit seriously. And the Minister of Education, by the way, agrees. <laughs> so I'll pass <laughs> to you. Very briefly. Uh, well, I'm ignorant in many things. Uh, uh, and uh, this is one of, I don't know how Ukraine, uh, you know, because I'm so ignorant about Ukraine. I'm enthused by a three days experience, uh, but it would be unethical for me to say something uh, if I don't know, if, you know, just to talk. Uh, what I know is that uh, where uh, it has started, it has started uh, only because somebody had the courage and the uh, optimism, uh, like uh, Bogdan here, uh, you know, to do an experiment. But then, uh, of course, uh, I'm not so naive or utopistic, you, to change uh, a, a system, uh, you need also consensus at the top, uh, because it's a uh, very political, and it should be done uh, involving all the stakeholders, uh, because otherwise, uh, one risk uh, to avoid, uh, certainly, is uh, to make uh, the old system uh, guilty. Nobody here is uh, the bad guy, you know, and certainly professors have been trained in that way. So we need uh, to be gentle and to promote change uh, on a win-win base. I would think uh, that that uh, would work also in Ukraine. But I don't know anything about beautiful country, beautiful people. Maybe there are a lot of other bad that, that uh, I didn't meet. You know, I saw Kiev. I don't, you know, I'm very ignorant. Because both these two questions relate to how could we bring about a change. I give a couple of examples, not to hold them up as the perfect examples, but just to say there are things that can be done. I come from Napa, California, and about 15 years ago, the city of Napa asked the businesses in the area, what could we do to educate our high school students more effectively to, be, to work in your companies? And they came up with a list of about 20 things they could do, and the number one on the list is, you are educating students to learn by themselves and act on their own and compete with each other, but once we hire them in the company, they're never expected to compete with others or act on their own. They're supposed to work as teams. Therefore, why don't you restructure the education so students are learning in teams and teaching each other? And that model was very, is very successful. 
So it's an example of one way, I don't say. Another one, some of you may be aware of Khan Academy, uh, which is this online uh, curriculum for primary and secondary school uh, where they've reduced train in it, it's example of how you can make learning active. What they've done in Santa Clara, California is they've done a flipped model. The students go home and watch the, the class instruction on Khan Academy. It's not done by the teacher at all. It's done by a professional instructor. And then they come into the classroom to interact with the teacher. And the teachers who were spending 5% of their time interacting with the students and finding out what their real interests and problems are is now spending 95% of the time as a real facilitator rather than just as a delivery system. Remember, the lecture system was invented hundreds of years ago when we didn't even have books. We're still using an old technology. Thank you. Uh, you know, for me, what I experienced mattered. The best teacher that I've had, and I'll just remind to those that perhaps not, do not know, I started under Poland. And then, of course, I had some education under the Soviet Union. And then I had some education under the German occupation. And then I had uh, some education in Canada, etc. And uh, a, and the doctor would say in Geneva, but the best teacher by all, and all this, and they said me more than 112, maybe 150, the best teacher that I had, surprisingly enough, happened to be a teacher of religion. He was a Greek Catholic monk. Now, why was he the best teacher? He made the greatest mark on me, but he, did not, he was teaching dogmatics and apologetics. But what he was telling us, don't accept the dogmas because they're there. Question them. Reason, may, maybe even, well, try to try to think, now, why did the dogma emerge? Maybe there's some practical reason behind it, but certainly don't blindly accept because it is just a dogma. Now, he was the one, so he was the only one that he really, he wanted to discuss with us, debate us, he wanted to think us, he wanted us to make us free people that actually, finally, we had to accept something and not accept one when we actually went through sort of our, <coughs> through our brain and, and our heart, if you like. And it was so much that actually his lectures, fortunately, were at the end of the day. And after his lectures, at least uh, some of us, you know, say 10, 12 of the class of 35, would walk him back to his monastery and say, what is it there, you know, Father Derda? You know, I think this way, and I think this way, and I think this way. And it was wonderful, you know, at, at the age of 15, 16, to be able to do it. You know, it was wonderful. So I certainly owe him a lot, this fact that I'm a free person in a sense that I allow myself to think and question things, etc., etc. But also, rather than just follow blindly things. So I just wanted to mention experience, because again, it happened here in Ukraine. So uh, there is a really a lot, a lot, a lot that we have to learn from outside, but some things we have to learn from our own experiences here. Uh, next, are you saying that or next question? Maybe, maybe. Uh, the question of uh, obviously teaching is an important question. In most of the Nobel Prize acceptance speeches, most of the people claim who were their professors and under whose influence they did their work. Uh, and then, of course, as my colleagues were telling various stories of their own life, let me tell you, I was pondering how about in my case, and I had a number of, of course, of very important persons, the president of our World Academy, the president of the Club of Rome, and I learned a lot of them, there is no doubt. But I would nevertheless like to say that the best uh, teachers I ever had were and are my students. <laughs> Next question. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, may I ask, uh, may I add a little bit of different topic to our discussion? I do admit that education is... I can't, I'm sorry. Are you here or are you there? I, I'm here. Yeah, that, ah, hello. <laughs> uh, hello. 
I, I realize that education is a really important topic and I am a teacher by my first education as well, but let me add a different, uh, another topic for discussion about paradigm change. Great. I represent a new non-governmental organization which is called uh, Baltic Black Sea Confederation and the idea is uh, the, uh, the alliance of uh, countries between the Baltic and Black Sea for the security and economic development. So what's, uh, I, I'm wondering what are your ideas or what do you think, are there any perspectives for such a union and is it possible to achieve security and development in this region through such a union? I mean union of such countries as Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania and other Slavonic countries in this region. Okay, maybe I would ask uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs Oresko to answer that question because I think he's more qualified than those that are sitting on the stage. Thank you so much for this question. Uh, in my view, it is much more theoretical than of practical nature. Why? We just, uh, during the uh, uh, our polls, discussed this issue with one of our uh, colleagues here in, in, in this hall, and I tried to uh, persuade him that uh, uh, if we have no concrete forms and ideas what we are talking about or what we are doing, it would be probably not possible to uh, react adequately on challenges we are facing now or which might arise in the future. So, put very simple question, whether Poland or Lithuania, for example, will join some kind of new format and they will leave NATO or the European Union. Is it of practical nature? For me, not. That is why we should, of course, think about some kind of cooperation, but probably try to involve Ukraine into already existing forms of cooperation, rather than think about something what, in my view, is once again of the theoretical nature. Thank you. Next I'm question. I'm oh. Mr. Bogdan. Uh, I am here, so yeah, I was raising hand. But she is here. No, no, no. I was one of the first. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexander. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask question uh, about good education practices. Well, ask it. Uh, yes, not uh, Mr. Gary uh, Jacobs uh, partly mm -hmm. answered this question, but that's why I, I want to um, ask another one. Do. So, uh, in respect. Uh, <laughs> of uh, crisis which is now in the world and I mean in Ukraine especially and international crisis what uh, we as uh, young people and civil society and media uh, must and can do uh, to create opportunities for all I mean for all uh, for world uh, human society but not for some some states or some people like it was after okay. the first and second world war question Gary that's a very big question and I'm going to give a very general answer because it will apply to people in all walks of life at different ages I think the most important thing that any of us can do to start off as the first step is to recognize that things can be different. Assuming that we already know they should be different and they can be better. And to work to recognize the many things that exist in the society that need not be the way they are. Uh, Alberto spoke earlier about uh, uh, the fact of in society is not just a system, it's a system that's distributing power. And it's a system that has always distributed power very unevenly. We used to have a time when there was a monarch and all the power was to one person. Now we're doing a little better than that. To be aware of the fact that so much of change is possible. And in our own lives to decide not to live according to the old pattern and just be acceptable according to the old standards, but to be what I briefly referred to as an individual. I think that, if you want an answer that applies to everybody, that's the starting point. 
I'll, I'll put it in some of the different words. Start with yourself. Uh, well, time for two more questions. There Can I ask my, my yes. Yes. questions? Just two questions. Yes. Well, I know there was a question here too. Okay, I'll come uh, to you. We favor ladies here. Okay, I'll make it to three questions because there's a man there. Okay. But do get to the question without preliminaries. Okay, good morning to everybody one more time. I'm Anastasia, I'm a student of Kyiv Mohila Academy. Uh, and uh, today we have talked, all have talked about the changes and opportunities uh, we are facing. And um, I, I can, uh, I'm convinced that uh, those people who are here are all open to these changes. But what can we do uh, with those who are not so open-minded? And uh, to those society that is not here, how can we change their minds to changes, to be open to changes? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take two other questions because maybe some of the questions can be actually answered uh, to, uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, yes? <laughs> okay. Wow. I know you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Masha. My name is Sasha. My name is Alexandra, and I am a member of the association Young People, Young Generation Will Change Ukraine. And I have a question for you. Thank you very much for your coming, for your sharing your wisdom with us. And I have a question about the second part of the, our topic: the role of Ukraine in this new paradigm, what Ukraine can bring to the world, and maybe some advices, some tips to young people, how to act, what to do to bring this, to make it happen. Okay, Thank you. the last question. No, sorry. No, may, may Did you, you already asked. Yeah. No, there was a man here, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Artem Bardas. I represent uh, National no, Mining. Ask the question. Okay, uh, well, uh, we, you talked about the new paradigm and the uh, full employment, and I'm afraid that the main contradiction here is the full employment is in uh, contrary with the scientific revolution, which actually well, uh, decreases. Don't give us a lecture, a question. So, uh, how can we overcome the contradiction between the scientific revolution and automatization uh, and the full employment? Demand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, will you volunteer some questions? But don't forget about this one, particularly. You, you do. Yeah, you, whoever of you want to. Okay, we start. Uh, right. Uh, a very brief answer to an important question is. First of all, the premise is questionable, though it sounds so logical that we won't ever question it. If you look at the, uh, the development of technology and mechanization over the last century, logic tells us that we should have 90% unemployment by now. And in the US, which is the most technologically adaptive country in the world, we should have 110% unemployment by now. We don't. The fact of the matter is that since 1950, in a period of rapid globalization, which is supposed to create unemployment, rapid technological development, which is another reason to create unemployment, and rapid population growth, we should be having 90% unemployment worldwide. The fact of the matter is, employment has grown faster than the population. That's a statistical fact. So we need to understand how that's happened. I answered your question earlier in my earlier the remarks by saying we have a biased system that's actually biased against people now, against employment now. Yeah. If we remove those biases and we really invest our money in the development of the human capital uh, rather than thinking that all our answers in mechanization, I, I don't say we should stop mechanizing. Let's remove the bias in favor of mechanization, which doesn't include the real public costs of pollution uh, and depletion of our econ uh, ecology, which are not factored when you make a decision to use a machine instead of a person. This situation will rectify itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, how do you promote change towards the people that are not convinced? Uh, well, it, there is a science how to promote change. You do a force fields analysis and see 
people are against uh, or neutral, and uh, you promote a win-win solution. The other thing, one of the best convincing thing, is to show pilot project uh, like the one of Bogdan in education, if it works, uh, somebody else will say, ha ha, after all, how the wheel spread? Somebody invented it, surely, but uh, it quickly you know, took over a, a lot of territory because it did work. Ukraine, how Ukraine uh, can uh, contribute to the world? Well, often, uh, again, uh, you know, would be ignorant uh, of Ukraine, uh, but I think uh, every situation of crisis, uh, when uh, people react uh, in a resilient way, they are then uh, offering an important lesson uh, to everybody to learn. So uh, when uh, under, uh, you know, dear circumstance, uh, you're able to do uh, your best, uh, then uh, you're teaching not only yourself and your people an important lesson, but to the whole world. And I sincerely hope uh, that it would be dramatically the case uh, for your country. Several very important questions. First, there is no conflict between the development of science and the employment. You can see this very simply in a following way. Just take the example of the one part of scientific research. This is physics. About 10 years ago, we formulated and are still using the phrase standard model, where the word standard model means that everything is standardized, that we are almost there. And you have read in the newspaper, for instance, among other things, that one of the missing block was whether there is the so-called God's particle or not, the famous Higgs boson. Okay, now we actually have discovered, or very likely we have discovered, the Higgs boson. Why do I say very likely? Because what we have found is we have found a particle that has that mass, but not necessarily all of the other properties. However, just when we did that, we became aware that this, what we are talking about, represents only 5% of the entire our universe, and that we don't know at all about other 95% of our universe, for which we use strange names, dark energy and dark matter. And besides this one universe, very likely, we believe there are many other universes, and we have reasons to believe this. So what is happening is old jobs, like, for instance, agriculture, will not be done. And not only that, the jobs of a typist is gone. The number of other jobs are being replaced by machines. And thousands of other machines, different ones, will be replacing certain things. And therefore, things will be changing. But who are making the machines? Human. How they are making it? Through science. So science and the employment are sort of coming together. As Gary said, the data show that it can be more of this. But it's not easy. We don't know how to do it. It's not a recipe. And because of that, there is no recipe. This is my answer to the question, what you, Ukraine, can do. You have unique history. You have unique culture. We need your culture as we need other three, four thousand different cultures. Because this is the answer. If you don't give the answer, that answer is lost. It's the same story in biology. If, for instance, wheat is gone or corn is gone or dogs are gone. Yes, of course, we can live without that. It would be very, very difficult. So your answer is important. You have to help the world, not only you, the world in achieving the paradigm change and fighting, finding the proper paradigm. Contrary to appearances, I'm actually the oldest man here on the stage, so I speak the last. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, invented that order. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'll give you another example about the fact that uh, technological innovations do not necessarily create unemployment. It happens to be in the Lake Geneva region in Switzerland. There is a polytechnic in Lausanne. 
which is first class, and a lot of people, uh, and they cooperate very well with a lot of enterprises. In fact, a lot of enterprises are created by the graduates of the CNC, like at MIT, remember the road, famous road. Now, it so happens that in Geneva, there is not much innovation, because actually, Geneva is really dominated by, let's say, what dominated in the sense, even economic sense, by the European headquarters of the United Nations, a lot of bureaucracy, and there are a lot of in different international organizations, some of them are kind of very good, foundations, God knows what, but there is no un innovation, and there is 7% unemployment, which for Switzerland is terrible. But for, for several decades, the unemployment in Switzerland was half a percent, which was too little. However, we could actually share with you uh, other pearls of wisdom, but it is time to actually get some calories rather than just wisdom, and therefore we'll break up now. And there is a fourchette, if I am well informed. Is there? I guess there is. So uh, we'll uh, get together here again at... Uh, 140? No, no, one, one, sorry, 140. At 140, exactly. You're right as usual. So at 140, we are back here. Thank you very much.